being here today. My name is Jennifer Batchelder. Just got blinded by the light. We're so glad you came out to see us today to join us for Mr. Tom's um, presentation. I just wanted to give those of you who may or may not remember a little bit of information about him. I'll have to read it because as most of you know, or some of you may know, I'm still very new here. So I have not memorized every biography. Uh, since 1994, Tom has served as museum director for Bellingrad Gardens and Home, overseeing the collections and archives housed in the 15-room Bellingrad Home. He is a graduate of the Winter Institute at Winter, Winter. Winter Tur, thank you, for the study of American decorative arts, both Addingham Summer School, studying English country houses and their collections, as well as the London Townhouse, and courses in the decorative arts in both France and Germany. <laughs> missing bit. He currently serves on the boards of Friends of the Alabama Governor's Mansion, Friends of Magnolia Cemetery, the Historic Mobile Preservation Society, the Historic Restoration Society, Cotton Hole, the Rotary Club of Mobile, and the Rotary Children's Foundation. He has written about Mobile's history with an emphasis on its architectural losses for more than 35 years and has been a regular columnist for Mobile Bay Magazine with his Ask McGee series for over 15 years. And for the past six years, he has appeared weekly each Thursday on NBC 15's Gulf Coast Today with a segment called Lost Mobile. Yes. Okay. So if you haven't watched that, be sure to check that out because you can learn a lot of information. I'm not quite sure if we could all ever learn as much that's in this. It's like a walking historical computer I have learned over the last few days. Um, but we are so glad he's going to share with you today this great presentation. And please do stay for lunch with us. Today we're having, you may have seen it when you came in, we're either going to have an option of chili dog with sweet potato fries or chicken teriyaki with garden vegetable rice. I called it chicken pechazzini while I got in trouble. <laughs> I should know that works. Uh, we also have our sandwiches and salad bar. Take a stroll in the gardens afterwards. If you haven't renewed your membership yet, please do so. And if you're not a member, please join us here at Bellingrass Gardens and Home as part of our family. Um, thank you so much for being here again. Here's Tom. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. And I'm going to talk last with our high tech uh, instrument for broadcast has apparently died on us. <laughs> Everybody get seated. Did you find fix it? No? Okay. Too bad. I'll just talk loud. Okay, our topic today is China mania. And I chose that because we've already talked about English silver, we've talked about glass, we've talked about porcelain and the stories behind a lot of the figures and what's going on, what does it mean. Uh, so today, since everyone always enjoys going to that butler's pantry and seeing what we will now call the Great Wall of China, <laughs> I thought you'd like to know more about what is in there and what Mrs. Bellingrad collected. How did she get all this China? Why did she get all this China? So I broke it into kind of three sections. One, we're going to start with the oldest pieces in the collection. Oh, my name just popped up. All right, oldest China. This is Mason's ironstone, and it is called the rose pattern. Mason produced ironstones, and they called it patented ironstone. This was starting in 1813. They started producing this. Now, this was a whole new idea in England to make China for a growing middle class population, and it was durable. This is an ironstone. This is not fine China but it is beautiful, and this is actually a dessert service. So remember, in the earliest part of the 19th century, houses did not have dining rooms. They had a, a room they would have turned into a dining space, and the dining often took hours. And the dessert course was extremely important. That was when the, 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 the guests would go out and come back in. They'd have a new tablecloth. In this dessert service, we laid down the, the table with all these cakes and cookies and fruit, very elegant, and it would be this, this pattern. So that's what this was uh, meant for. And we do not know where Mrs. Bunga purchased this, but what this is in the 1943 inventory. Now, this is an interesting platter that you probably have seen and not even known you've seen. It hangs in the bottle room. 
this uh, mark on it is spurious. It was involved in a lawsuit. A man named John, and believe it or not, he claimed his name was Wedge Wood, stole <laughs> this mark from the Wedgwood factory and is using it. Now, I wanted to show you this. The English are very helpful, for the most part, in dating their ceramics, which the French are not. So this is a registry mark. The S here is for the year 1849. The H is for April. Two is the second, which it means this was made on April 2nd, 1849. <coughs> The name of this pattern, as you can see in that oval, is what? California. And what is going on in 1849? The California Gold Rush. So here they are in England, hearing about this American oddity of this gold rush. They name this pattern California, and I suppose that's what they think California looks like. <laughs> in that picture. It looks more like something Cecil B. DeMille would do in the silent movie era with, you know, gondolas and uh, these great, great palaces and all, but I love this with this idea of naming it for something that's in the news. It's very modern and current. They're trying to, to grab this, and these are very collectible, and this platter, Mrs. Bellingbrass inventory, just says she bought it from an old gentleman who had it in his family for many years, and they're very proud of it. This is actually a wedge wood, and it is actually, the, I didn't put the mark on it, it was made in 1863, July of 1863, and they're calling their product Pearl Stone Ware. That platter was also was called Pearl Stone Ware, all one word, but wedge wood called it Pearl Stone Ware, two different words. Uh, so this is 1863. Now, we also have um, a lot of French in the collection. This is part of Majolica, a uh, set of salad plates. It's called the um, napkin pattern because it's supposed to look as if a napkin is sitting on the plate. And it was made, let me get to my page on this one. It's got in the wrong spot. It was made sometime in the 1870s. Now, the interest in this, it was made in northeastern France. The name of the company that made it was Utz Schneider and Company. So it reminds you that a lot of these companies and makers, because of the borders moving around at this time, suddenly these Germans are living in France. He was a Bavarian-born maker of, 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 of uh, Majolica, starting in the 1860s. And the real uh, expert on this was actually English for a minute. Mint made a lot of majolica. It's highly collectible. And uh, I was at a conference once where we went out to someone's house and they had built this beautiful solarium with these huge pieces of majolica, these pots on stands uh, that hold all these ferns and things. So they, were, they were, uh, did a lot of garden uh, work. Now, one of the other products that we have or, uh, China is just known as Old Paris. And you may have heard that term Old Paris, the French are making this, it was hardly ever marked. The, uh, this is from a tea service and dates to about 1850 to 1860. Uh, and this refers to porcelain made around Paris. There were good clay deposits there. So porcelain was made in different factories around Paris, then shipped into the city of Paris where it was decorated by different decorating houses. So it was kind of a, uh, a, a several groups would be involved in this. So it was very collectible, or rather uh, very, very popular, and was exported a lot to the United States. <coughs> and we have this coffee and tea service, also uh, old Paris, so it's unmarked. But what's interesting to me, when you look at these pieces, remember, this is not transfer where, where they're putting decals on them. All of this art is hand-painted on these. So you've got this beautiful bower of flowers here. Uh, you've got every teacup has a different person on it. So you got you've got this, and it's, again, it's looking back to the 18th century. This idea of the gallants, the shepherds and shepherdesses, frolicking around in the in the countryside. So, uh, yeah, you know, that's what you got here. And here's this man who came sitting there contemplating tea. So there's that set. Is that real gold on it? Huh? Yes, it's gilt. Mm -hmm. Now this set is one of my favorites in the house. Mrs. Bellingrath bought this from a family that lived over near Leinkoff School in Mobile. 
and we had this thing listed as Paris, I mean, excuse me, it was listed when I came, they kept calling this Tucker China. William Ellis Tucker was the first American to produce fine china in Philadelphia in the early 19th century. And his factory was only open a short time. It is highly collectible. Every major museum in the United States has decorative arts, usually has William Ellis Tucker China. This is not William Ellis Tucker China. In fact, I had the, I had only been here a few months, and the docents from Bayou Bend, which is the art museum in Dallas, excuse me, Houston, uh, came out, and here I am stupidly calling this William Ellis Tucker China, and they're looking at each other, and they're very polite ladies, and they all look and said, that doesn't look like what we've got. Well, with more research, it had nothing to do with Philadelphia. It's made in France. And the way I found out who exactly made this was we had an expert on Haviland porcelain come in. And he recognized these pieces and said, this is all in my book that had just been published on Haviland. Now, Haviland is an interesting company. It was founded in Limoges in 1842. So not Paris, Limoges. And it was produced, uh, founded by two American brothers named Haviland, who had originally come from New York. Hmm. And they'd gone to France to be in the China importation business or exportation of the United States. And they started observing how these French factories were operated, and they really thought, we can do better. We're going to show them some American ingenuity. So the Haviland firm was founded by Americans. And the interesting tale I'll add, uh, Bob Dorries, who was the expert on Haviland, got a grant, and he went to France because he wanted to see, he, he, I'll back up, he had gone to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and he found these oversized books with ink drawings of blanks. And they were trying to figure out what all this was. They said this man had dropped it off at the Metropolitan Museum on Fifth Avenue like in 1954. No one really knew what it was. Well, he started researching and realized this was Haviland's pattern book from about 1850. And he went to France and met up with the Haviland descendants and described this book. And one of the descendants said, oh, I've got lots of those. And they went in guest room and pulled these big books out from under the book. And there you find all of these shapes, which lets you know that Haviland was designing these. And they did not mark them in those days. So they were being called Old Paris, which was a little more accurate than trying to say it in the camp Philadelphia. But this said, uh, I love it. I don't know if you remember Nell Rutherford, but I remember she looked at this and she said, Tommy, I knew those people you're talking about. I just didn't think they had the wherewithal to have Tucker China in that hat. <laughs> they thought of it. It's very modest now. But um, then the, when I came, the ladies were still taking, talking about uh, that this was William Ellis Tucker. And the, oh, the, that, this is my favorite. The Jackie Kennedy wanted this for the White House because she wanted American yes, China. Yes. So you might remember that from my talk on uh, mm -hmm. falls. Boy, and then this is another Haviland set. And the reason we know this is Haviland, and I want to show you some of the, again, all hand painted. It's working. And the Here, reason right? we know this is Haviland is because of the handles on the soup tureen and the entree dish. Notice this pattern of ivy leaves. Guess what? It's the Haviland pattern called ivy. <laughs> and you can find this in multiple antebellum homes. It's done in different colors. So if you go to Oakley, they've got a full set of this with a uh, kind of an apricot border on it. But you look at the handles, and there they are, those big triple ivy leaves in gilt. And guess what? This is Haviland. There are those ivy leaves up there. For some god on I don't I guess nobody in the Bellingrath home all those years ever put those two pieces of china together and said, look, these are identical. That is the same uh, blanks, but they're painted in this hot pink. This is another dessert service. And notice every single dish has a different fruit on it. They're no two alike. They're all different fruits. Wow. So again, a dessert service. This was referred to in the uh, old listing as, um, what, what did they call it? Oh, they said it was Wooster. Wow. Now the other interesting thing, the compote that went with this, this is how we got started. When Bob Dorries looked at it, he said that compote is happening. It's identical to the 1861 White House China that Mrs. Lincoln ordered. So they have this pattern in there, too. Now, Haviland got a lot simpler over the years. You can see that those pieces I'm showing you from the 1850s and 60s are very like the furniture. Rococo Revival, very over-the-top, lots of decoration. By the end of the 19th century, they're switching back to just very simple. Now, this uh, mark, again, the French are not very helpful. 
with dating their china. So all we know is that this pattern was in use um, around 1900 to 1930. So we believe it is the first china that Mrs. Bellingrad would have had in their home on Ann Street. Remember, they married in 1906. So this would have been very fashionable at that point. Now, we're going to move to uh, into the 20th century, remembering that from about 1911 until 1936, for really 25 years, the Bellingrass were in residence on Ann Street. And that's where a lot of China was purchased for their home and, and for their entertaining. And one of my favorites is uh, Billy Sunday. Do you all know who Billy Sunday was, the great evangelist? The Bellingrass entertained Billy Sunday in that home on Ann Street. He was a Presbyterian. And the, the story in Mr. Bell is written that uh, Mrs. Bellingrath did not approve of seeing Billy Sunday pat Mrs. Sunday on the derriere in her home. She thought that was a bit over the top. <laughs> but so I know they were entertaining there a good bit. Um, so the china that she's collecting in the 1920s are patterns like Black Knight. Um, and I love this book that I found on eBay, The Gracious Art of Dining by Black Knight with their address on Fifth Avenue, New York, um, 1927. So this would have been the time she is buying this china. Coca-Cola stock is going through the roof in the early 20s with prohibition. Their stock prices doubled and tripled. So between stock and Coca-Cola and the Coca-Cola sales mobile, I don't think there was a difficulty with buying anything Mrs. Bellingham wanted. And this was a very elegant shop. And if you look in this design, you will also see that Black Knight not only sold high-end china, but glassware. And we have some of this crystal in house too. So they wanted you to buy everything there. So you could get what's in the foreground. They were very proud they introduced these large, look like big goblets that we have. And they would put ice in and you serve grapefruit in them. A very elegant way to do that. In fact, I'll tell you a true story that we know they were used for that in Bellingrad homes. One of the nieces of Mrs. Bellingrass from, a great nieces, uh, uh, that was Mr. Bellingrass' niece from uh, Montgomery, the daughter brought a friend down to spend a long weekend at, 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 at the house, and she, the, brought, the friend went home to Montgomery, and Monday morning, the mother said, well, Janie, what would you like for breakfast? And she said, I would like a slice of gra uh, grapefruit. And she said, oh, that's easy. So she sliced the grapefruit, put it in front of her with a spoon, sugar. And the little girl looked down and said, no, mama, that's not how you serve it. You serve it on ice. It needs to have a maraschino cherry and mint leaves. And she went on and on to describe exactly how she'd eaten it at the Bellingrass home. And the mother said, you're not with the Bellingrass anymore. Eat your breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> so, so lo and behold, there is a letter over there on the left from the Black Knight China Company, 1939, telling Mrs. Bellingrath about the pricing of the china you see on the right. And the pattern was called Dorset Pink. What I really love about the china that Black Knight is producing and selling is that they pick these very British sounding names. Black Knight kind of sounds English. It could not be a more German firm. And the firm was in operation with the pattern marks they were using here from 1925 until, not surprisingly, 1941. Um, now, what's interesting, the letter is dated 1939. And in 1939, the United States raised the tariffs on German luxury goods to 25%, which meant that only the wealthiest of wealthy could afford it because you could get Lennox or any number of British china makers, beautiful china, without paying that kind of overhead. So uh, if the firm, uh, of course, was long gone by the time we entered World War II. But there's another one. So you can see how this would have really appealed to Mrs. Bellingrath with the uh, beautiful floral centerpieces in here and would look wonderful on her table. Then there's the mark. Notice that you would have to look under the plate to notice that it was made in Klingberg, Bavaria. So that's the only the way you know it. This one actually has a French sounding name, Cloison, for these beautiful plates. And this is one of my favorite, this uh, cobalt. Uh, and th this is a good example. When I came to Bellingrath, the, the Butler's Pantry was all mixed up. I mean, this was all interspersed with English mint and China because it was the same color. And I just felt things ought to be separate if you're going to talk about China. Let's keep the English over here and the Germans over here, and the French over here. <laughs> keep everybody within their borders. 
But this is a beautiful pattern, and it's called lambrequin. And a lambrequin is the um, it's kind of a collar that a knight wears. So again, they're looking back at medieval times. And this is paired. This is the pattern. Antoinette, you could get more French than that, but again, black knight, big, deep gumbo plate, and that is the best one I could photograph. The others are so worn, and it shows these were used and enjoyed, and surprise, surprise, gumbo plates on, on Fowl River, you know they ate a lot of gumbo soup. So I thought we'd look at um, really the mid-1930s really going on. What is Mrs. Bellingrad find? What's happening in the mid-1930s? Well, she's leaving Ann Street and moving down here to the newly completed home. So she is buying all antique furniture, and she's putting to get by more china. I don't think she ever saw patterns she didn't like. Um, now, this pattern confused people for years and years and years. I would hear, this is French. Well, actually, why wouldn't it be French? Who's looking at you but Josephine? And we've got Napoleon on the other place. Um, and the mark was royal. So every early inventory we had called this French China. It's not French China. It was made in Sebring, Ohio. <laughs> we actually had uh, quite a lot of royal China from Sebring, Ohio. The factory was not even completed until 1934. So people kept thinking this is old China. Oh, and the uh, one set of service place has a classical design, and it said oh, these were all hand painted by this artist who had died like in 1804. So, I mean, it's completely wrong information, but very glittery, but it's intriguing that uh, this, these service plates, or they're a little smaller than service plates, they may have been used for desserts, were all, all of this rural china was in the basement when Mrs. Belgrad died. So she was not using this very often, apparently. So I think she got into that black knight china and decided she liked it better is what I've decided. <laughs> Well, what, the other thing I want to talk about today is what changes about the retailing of fine china in the United States. Well, if you think back, in the late, by the late 1880s, 1890s, it was a given that when a bride announced her engagement, friends and family gave gifts. But those gifts were not coordinated. And well-to-do families, normally the mother of the bride would go with her and decide what china she should have, and they would give the lucky couple a set of eight or 12 place settings, the full thing. Now that, of course, today we wouldn't, um, nobody does that. In fact, it got out of favor uh, by World War I, probably because of the shortages of china getting from, from England. And wedding gifts um, had been chosen at random. So a bride would get all kinds of mismatched things. And then they would turn around and return everything. And the retailers got tired of all those return returns. It was, it was time consuming, they were losing money. So they came up with this idea of having a bridal department that would coordinate everything. And the first one to do this was in Chicago at Marshall Fields. And what they had in a space like this, it was not a quote unquote China department, but you went into the bride uh, to be, we go in there and sit down with a consultant who would discuss with her her taste, what she should be looking at for linens, for furniture, for crystal, and China. So it was a one stop, and she would corral her to go to all these different departments where she would then put them to that salesperson. And guess what? It started, it took off in a hurry. And by the um, late 1930s, there were China departments uh, spread out, and this bridal idea was all over the United States. Even uh, low-end department stores were doing it. And that's what they literally called these the Great Walls of China. Yeah. So suddenly a bride would walk into the China department. There's glassware down on the shelf below. They could see what should go with what and what they'd want to put uh, for their friends to give them for their um, wedding presents. Now, uh, and there's a wonderful 1950s uh, view of a China department with every kind of pattern you can think of so the bride-to-be could roam around and look at all this and decide. Now another change I discovered was uh, department stores on had not thought about setting a dining table and putting the china on there for the bride to look at and crystal and all the, the, the odds and ends for a place setting. That changed by 1930 and the first to do that was Gimbel's on Broadway in New York. 
they had nine big plate glass windows facing Broadway. And each of those nine windows featured a big table laden with all this beautiful china and glassware. And they said the people lined up around the block to look at this. Um, and by the late 1930s, again, the retailers all gather and get ideas. They were all copying that. So you had, quote, unquote, table shows in every major department stores in the country. In fact, Gump's uh, in San Francisco, which sadly just went under, counted 18,000 customers viewing 30 tables on display in their store over a two-week period. That's a lot of people interested in looking at China. Um, so, so where did Mrs. Bellingrass shop? Well, she shopped where everybody nice in New York shop, B. Altman and Company on Fifth Avenue. Um, and B. Altman was one of the first to have a bridal registry and China department, and they had the largest China department in New York City. So it's easy to see Mrs. Bellingrad going into Fifth Avenue. This building is still there. Sadly, B. Altman and Company is gone, along with a lot of other stores I grew up going in and out of. But um, let's see, I got my bill of sale. So B. Altman gets to be synonymous with China and glassware, and Chris, but China was their strong suit. And lo and behold, here we've got a dinnerware price list from B. Altman for Mrs. Bellingrad, and here are the prices. If you want dinner plates in Porsche, $40 per dozen. <laughs> 12 plates for $40. Um, if you want square salads, a dozen square salad plates, $48. Coffee, cups and saucers, teacups, $40 a dozen. After dinner coffee. So that's where Mrs. Bellingrad was buying a lot of her chime. There it is, Fifth Avenue at 34th Street. And this, I love this. Now this is a period. Service for the hostess suggests interesting and unique table settings and answer questions about table service and the general problems that may perplex the hostess. <laughs> now, I hope you all aren't too perplexed that you have to go to a department store these days to get unperplexed. <laughs> and there is her Porsche China. Now, Porsche was produced by Royal Wooster, which began producing fine China in 1862. And there is the mark. And Royal Wooster is very helpful with the date marks. Except in the center of that circle is the number 51. I'm sorry, and that actually refers to the date Royal Wooster was founded in 1751 by Dr. John Wall. Um, by 1922, their advertisement is called Royal Wooster, the Aristocrat of English China. And the dating system here, and it may be hard on the back to see, but under that circle in Royal Wooster, there is a star. The star indicates 1916, and the little dots around it are, is each year after 1916. So we know that this plate was made in 1922. Now, each piece may be made different times uh, in that period, but we know that's from 1922, the very year Royal Wooster was calling themselves um, the uh, aristocrat of English China. Now, another one we know for a back in Altman's is Mrs. Bellingrass Ellesmere. So she goes again into B. Altman in 1940 and sees this pattern, falls in love with it, and buys a service for eight. So it was the original service of eight. Um, now, Crown Staffordshire, unfortunately, uh, and by the way, Ellesmere was a uh, patron of the arts and a knight of the garter. He was the first Duke of Ellesmere. So they, they are, you look at these royal names to come up with. Um, and the, unfortunately, Mark Sta uh, Grant Staffordshire didn't do too much about dating. They weren't into that. So all we know is that this mark was first used in 1906. Here's another Royal Wooster pattern, the Regency, bought to match Mrs. Bellingrass' red and white dining room. There. Here we got another date. This one has three circles under the Royal Wooster. The three circles means 1932. They ran out of space for all those dots with the star, so they started coming up with other ways to date it. So that's 1932, and then you add those dots around it. Well, there's seven dots. 1939 is when this china was produced. 
And she liked Royal Wooster because here's another pattern. <laughs> this is the one we always put out at Mardi Gras time. And what could be more English than this? Of course, they're alluding to the Prince of Wales with those plumes. But this is called Florizel. And if we have any Shakespeare scholars in here, Florizel comes from Shakespeare's play, The Winter's Tale. And Florizel is the son of the king of Bohemia. And in the play, he falls in love with a lowly shepherdess. And the shepherdess is very beautiful, and the king of Bohemia does not want the prince marrying a, a common shepherdess. But of course, as the plot goes on, lo and behold, she's of royal birth. They get married, and everything ends happily. So Florizel was happy. Now, this has a lot more dots on it. This indicates 1941. Remember, Mrs. Bellingrath passes away in 1943. So she is shopping right to the bitter end. I mean, but it shows to me that she is entertaining a great deal at the home. She is buying more china because the china gets broken and, and she wants more pattern. And Luther the butler said she used to come down every morning and they'd meet and discuss which china to be used for lunch and dinner, maybe breakfast too. And so she was constantly changing out. They did, she didn't want to use the same china day in and day out. So that's Florizel or Mardi Gras china. Uh-oh. We went past the Royal Dalton. Now, Royal Dalton has a dating system. They're, they were a lot smarter than Royal Wooster. They just put a number out to the side, and you take the year 1927, and you add that to that number, and it tells you that it was produced in 1940. Now, I think it's interesting, don't you, that those plates I'm showing you are being produced 1939, 1940, 1941, 1942 in England. And what's going on in England? The Blitz. The war is raging, has, has since 1939. How is it that they are still producing all this fine china up in Staffordshire? Well, uh, I'll tell you. The uh, British government told the potteries up in the Staffordshire region to all shut the doors, turn everything over to armaments that they didn't need to be making fine china. Well, the owners of Minton, Royal Dalton, Royal Wooster, all of them went to, to Churchill and said, you can't do this to us. Look what happened to France. Well, what they were talking about was, in, if you went in any grand house in Mobile or any place else in the early 1900s, before World War I, chances were the hostess would show you her Havel in China. That was all disrupted with World War I. They were not able to produce they lost their footing. The British are the ones that jumped in in the 1920s and started really producing fine china. The beautiful patterns that Minton did, Royal Wooster, all these patterns start in the 20s and they're being shipped to the United States. And their only competition was Lennox. Lennox was making fine china and they were going to try to take over and take that market and they wanted it. And that's the other reason they went to Churchill and said, Lennox will put us out of business in the United States. They are built, making such beautiful china in uh, New Jersey. In fact, I did not show you one of these patterns. The, notice how white this china is. Lennox clay that they get in New Jersey, they have a much creamier look to it. In fact, we have a set of spode plates, also from the late 30s, that they that spode in England changed their formula trying to look like Lennox. Yeah. Because Lennox was doing such a great marketing job saying you don't want real white china because it's not as warm. It's warm and have this you know, kind of creamy look to it for food. And then so even a uh, British firm like Spode is trying to copy Lennox. So the uh, British makers won out. You could not buy this in England during the war. It was strictly to be shipped to the United States with revision that when those ships came back, from the United States, they had what they needed for the war in England. So that's why they were able to keep on producing. And once the war ended, it never their, their production just went right back. When you think of the 1950s and brides like the Eisenhower daughters are getting married and what, you know, which China they're looking, it becomes a big business. And all of those walls of China are going strong right up until the last decade or two. And fortunately, they're going by the wayside. I think the only one we have left in Mobile is down at Zundel's. I can't think of any other place that has fine china displayed like that anymore. And you know as well as I do that a bride and groom nowadays is much more likely not to even go into a department store. They're going to do everything online. And you're going to have to go to a website 
for their wedding and they're going to tell you where they want you to buy things. And half the time it's not good china. It's going to be electronics or linens or who knows what. Um, so again, we're going to start calling this the Great Wall of Bellingrath, China. Uh, since we, we're going to keep it there because that is one of the most popular rooms in the Bellingrath home for those of sure most of you have been in there. Um, but hopefully when you come through next time, you'll recognize a lot of these. For the most part, I've got some terms so you can look at the marks. Um, and I did that to begin with because I could cheat that way. And so when someone asked me a pattern, I said, well, let me know. Oh, roll this to portion. But uh, I think it's, it's interesting, though, to know that we've got this China going back to you know, the 18 teens all the way up to World War II. And that it was all purchased by Mrs. Bellingrath and was purchased to be enjoyed by her and her guests. And with that, I'll open the floor if you have any questions. Yes? What about silver to go with each set of china? Oh, she just had one pattern. One pattern? She had King Edward. Well, I'll take that back. She had two. One we have very little of because it was used every day. And that was um, a very simple colonial revival pattern, very popular. I wonder if it, it's not Gorham. Gorham had Plymouth, and this was another pattern. It was very, very simple. And the King Edward is 1901, um, much more elaborate. Is it Sterling? Sterling, oh yes. Oh, yeah. Miss Bellingham wouldn't have anything but Sterling. <laughs> <laughs> now, she may not have had 1906. I don't know what she had in 1906. But this, so it, it's uh, Sterling by White. Yes? Do you uh, know the name of the kingdom of It has no name that we can find. Apparently, Royal Dalton was, you know, Royal Dalton. Our collection of Bellingham, that's what we were strong on, is the, the Royal Dalton figures that they made. Now, their figures, are they, every one of them has a name to it, and there's a story behind each one, you know, whether it's coming from a popular song or from Shakespeare or whatever, each one has a, a character name. But the China just has no name on it at all. How many oh. sets, how, yes. how many sets did you say she had? She had nine sets of China. And eight sets of service plates. And remember, service plates never have food on. <laughs> service plates are just to look at when you sit down and the butler or the maid places the first course on top of it and then removes the service plate and the soup plate or whatever is on top of it and replaces it with the next plate. You should never, ever have a blank space in front of you. That's it cardinal sin. You can, in other words, they don't clear the whole table. When that plate's removed, another one's put down in front of you. We'll have to have another course on yeah. table <laughs> service. And, 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 which, and how do you put the finger bowls out? Yes, uh, could you say a word about the difference in the clays between porcelain and bone china? It, it's all to do with the chemical makeup. Bone china acts as bone in it, and regular porcelain does not. And of course, in, in what they're all trying to do with fine china, as they have all the way back to Meissen in Germany in the 18th century, they wanted true porcelain that when you picked up a plate, you could see light through it. Now, you cannot see light through any of that stoneware. But when you pick up a beautiful thin piece of porcelain china, they want you to see a, a translucent light through it. Mel? Well, uh, just curious, yeah. what type of bone would they use? You know, animal bones. <laughs> Just some Animal. Kind of <laughs> Not you. <laughs> yeah. Mrs. Bellingrath was 64 when she died. And he was 86. So he lived you know, in the house a total of 20 years. So he used, this was continuing to be used. We got pictures of him sitting at the table with his sisters, and the Porsche china is on the table. And the one thing you can't see, you can barely see it, but one of the nieces said they can remember being in the pantry with Luther and he would let her do the molds and she had wooden molds to do butter pats in the shape of flowers that would be on the butter plate. And she said she thought that was so neat that she could learn how to do that. So does he paint? Or Some of this china that I showed you was transfer where that's where it's based on decal they're putting on there, and then they're firing it. So that, the, but the old Paris, they didn't have that in front. They were actually had, they would have been artisans actually sitting there painting. And so that's why when you look at like the Havilland china, a lot of times you don't ever see two identical because you've got different artists doing the flowers. I mean, they're going by a certain pattern, but there are differences. That's incredible. 
Anybody else? Well, thank you for coming and I hope you stay for lunch. And next week, Chuck will be talking about the Cascading Moms. So don't miss that. Thank you.